I promised perhaps that I would do a recap. So kindly give me three minutes, nothing more, that we go through these steps. There's one thing that Dr. Papu said that uh, if you miss the if you miss one of these steps, um, there's one that will that may not make sense, or the following one may not make sense. Um, so as I welcome you this morning, I want to say. Um, step number one, what we were taught is that God is love. It was about God's love for men. Understand one thing as you come to God. God is not a tyrant, but he is loving and he is compassionate. Step number two, acknowledge your fallen nature, your sinful nature, and then recognize your need for Christ. Recognize your need for Christ. Step number three, repent. And we were taught that true repentance is when you are truly sorry for what you have done for the sin against your God. Not because of just the dire consequences of um, a, a, your, 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 your sin, but that you are truly sorry for what you have done. Step number four, confess your sins, come to God and confess your sins. You will remember that he is faithful and, ju and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, and step number five um, has to do with consecration. This is where you surrender all to Jesus. On your own, you will not make it. You will fall back on sin, to sin, with sin, and everything around sin. But if you surrender all to Christ and you give up everything that has a potential to separate you from Christ, you have a fighting chance um, to, 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 to come to Christ. Step number six, faith and acceptance. It had to do with faith and acceptance. Now, you, this is where you accept by faith that the loving God, not the tyrant, not the one with the shamble waiting um, uh, to punish you, the loving God has actually forgiven your sins. And step number seven is where you begin the life of discipleship. This is where you um, begin the life that is a blessing to others. You you, you do what Christ tells you. You follow in his footsteps, just as the disciples of old, the Peters and the Johns and the Matthews and all of those. Step number eight has to do with growing in Christ. Just think of the growth of a child from infancy to toddler to being a, um, a, a young girl or a young boy and teenager and all of those, that is the growth process. Growth is not a once-off event. It a process. You move as you move from darkness into the light. You learn to abide in Christ at all times, and you let Him teach you uh, um, ways. Step number nine has to do with resting in Christ, restfulness um, in Christ. This one I love um, the most. Now it's like you have arrived at your PO box destination and you live with Christ. You know that this is your home and what happens? You go where he sends you. You do what he tells you. You are home. You rest um, in Christ. And um, what a week it has been. And um, we are in for yet more steps. And we would like now to give over to Dr. Papu to carry on. Dr. Papu, I will not be with you tomorrow, as you know. So for me, it is a thank you and a goodbye, the face to face like this. But I will be on the platform um, tomorrow. Let me give over you, to you, um, Fundiswam, to continue with the lessons. Amen. Thank you, thank you, my sister. It looks like your tender uh, comes to an end today, and some of us have to continue. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Thank you for having this ship. Uh, you made a big difference. We'll miss you tomorrow. I'll feel very alone tomorrow, but I'm sure there'll be someone who'll take your place. <laughs> Mom's order will it's be been, there, It's sure. been beautiful. You just brighten the morning. Uh, thank you very much. And, and greetings to everyone, beloved, and um, I trust that 
We had a wonderful morning. You know what they say about waking up in the morning, you're rehearsing rehearse, uh, resurrection. Uh, it's like you were dead the whole night. You didn't even know where you were. Some of us didn't even think. We're not even aware that we were sleeping. We only woke up and said, oh, uh, I'm still here. And say so we have a new day and may God bless you. Let's, let's run quickly with our uh, two steps and we're left with two tomorrow that we'll de to deal with tomorrow. Um, and so what I was saying today, we're looking at the knowledge of God and the privilege of prayer, getting to know more about God and also learning to pray, li living a life of prayer. So the question then, how do we maintain and further develop the inward peace uh, for restfulness and of course, the outward behavior of, of discipleship? How do we enhance uh, that? Uh, which was step number six and, and seven. And eight and nine says we grow up into Christ. We abide in Christ by faith. Christ abides in our hearts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit become visible in our lives. There's a contrast in, in the life that we used to live and the life that we currently live. And of course, we also learn to share the love of God to others, work in the life, witnessing to God's wonderful salvation, um, letting people know about God. So the next two steps that we're going to look at is the knowledge of God, getting to know God even more, and of course, the privilege of prayer, learning to pray. That's basically all uh, seeks to enhance our journey, our, our growth. Um, so you see the first step, which is um, love of God, continues right through, even in, in our growth. Because the more we know God, the more we know how sin, our sinful sin is, the closer we come to God. And how do you come closer to God? You come closer to God as you read the scripture. If you would become acquainted with the Savior, you've got to study the scripture. <clears throat> John 6, 53 and, and, and 63, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You need that just like a plant needs nourishment. And he says that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And we find that as we meditate upon, upon, uh, upon the Bible, upon the God's word, that um, experience will give tone and strength to our spiritual nature. It will, it will tone our spiritual muscles. It will make us strong as we read. Uh, it's good to listen to sermons, beautiful. It's good to read books about the Bible, but find time to read your Bible, dig, dig. Sometimes it's not easy, it's not just running through, it's struggling, what does this mean? Compare this with that one. Um, you don't need to have gone to Helderbeck or Solusi or Baraton or AUA to be able to follow the Bible. Get the version you can understand. And they say the best version is the one you read. And, and here's a very interesting um, observation here that Nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect. There is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. If you want to um, strengthen your mind, read the book. Read the book. Find time to read. To read the book. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the fac faculties as the broad enabling truths of the Bible. We've seen it, and those who devote their lives in reading the Bible. God has a way of strengthening your mind so that you even grasp other uh, subjects outside uh, of the Bible. And if, if the word of God was studied, was studied as it should be, and she says, Ellen Joy, man would have a breadth of mind and nobility of character and a stability of purpose, really seen in these days. We'll be stable, we would be focused and strong if only we take time to read the word of God. Um, as we pray in our secret places, uh, we seek God, we want to know his truth, uh, the angels will help us uh, to understand and help us to understand the, the word of God. And the Holy Spirit will illumine our minds. So we need to take time and, and read. And as we do so, we get acquainted, we get to know who God is. Um, I'm going to say it again, listening to someone's is good. But let's take time. Let's take time to read our Bible. Find time. You have a structure where you're going to read your Bible. And for some of us, it starts with reading that Sabbath school faithfully and, and really going through it. And of course, um, reading 
uh, directly where you open your Bible and read your Bible. The last one uh, for today is the privilege of prayer. Prayer, taking time. And uh, thank Tiria for the uh, message there on prayer, what prayer does. It's amazing. We've said so many things about prayer. Um, one of the best definition of prayer is that it is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. It's like when you're praying, you're talking to a friend, what a friend we have in Jesus, and you just share, you open your heart, you tell, tell him about your fears, tell him about your joys, tell him about your struggle. Not because it is necessary uh, in order to make known to God what we are. No, God knows already. But when you talk to God, you become aware of your challenges. When you talk to God, it enhances your appreciation of your situation when you talk to God. Of course, this is not just psychological. You're just talking to a tree. You're talking to a God who listens, to a God who answers prayer. And, and, and we've, it has also always been said, prayer does not bring God down to us, but it brings us up to him. We are taken on the wings of prayer to the heavenly mansions above. The darkness of the evil one and closes uh, those who neglect to pray. When we neglect to pray, we're inviting demons to encamp uh, in our homes. When we neglect to pray, we invite alien forces uh, to come in and mess our peace in our homes and in our churches. There are certain conditions. I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, reflecting on those conditions upon which we may expect that God will hear and answer our prayers. And I've managed to uh, get about eight, I think there were nine, but I struggled to get the ninth. Um, I'm sure if you can get the um, ninth um, condition. In other words, there are conditions that God has stipulated in his word that if you fulfill this condition, prayer, <laughs> your prayer, uh, God will answer your prayer. There are certain conditions. So let's look at conditions, at those conditions. Condition number one that we need to fulfill is we need to feel our need of help from him. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, who long after God may be sure that they will be filled. When we come to pray to God, let it not just be routine. Let's come because we have something that we need to talk to God about. There's something actual, something about our lives, about the lives around us that we need to share with God, that we need to present to God. And here the beautiful statement, our greatest need especially when we feel that it is itself an argument and it pleads most eloquently in our behalf. Our greatest need is the argument we bring to God. Like a Hannah, sometimes you may not even say it, but God can read those moving lips and answer a prayer that won't even be articulated and verbalized. He that spared not his own son, Romans 8, 32, but delivered delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We approach him knowing that we approach a God who loves us, presenting our needs to him. So condition number one, uh, we need to feel our need of, of God. Um, condition number two, if we regard iniquity in our hearts, you know what Isaiah says, if we regard iniquity, iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any known sin. It doesn't say if we are not perfect, but we cling to a known sin. The Lord will not hear us, beloved. But the prayer of penitent, of the penitent, contrite soul is always accepted. You, you, are, you are swimming in sin. You are comfortably um, residing uh, in sin and you approach God, you talk to him and you ask him, for favors, you ask him for this. You don't even ask him to forgive your sin. So that prayer, and the Lord will not hear, and not because his, his ears are hard to listen. It is because of our sins, because of our iniquity. We, we, we want to talk to God, but we don't want to connect with him if we regard iniquity. But it doesn't mean, of course, you can approach him and say, Lord, I have no iniquity in my life, so I can you can hear me now. No, it is the merit of Christ 
that will forever commend us to the favor of God. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will save us. In other words, the fact that you have no sin doesn't mean, therefore, you qualify. I have no sin. Now you must listen to me. Even when we know we have confessed our sins to God, when God hears us, it is because of the merit of Jesus Christ who covers us with his blood. And condition number three, uh, if we want a prayer to prevail, is faith. Uh, an element of prevailing prayer is faith. We need to have faith when we approach God. We don't approach God and say, well, maybe if you are, well, we'll see what will happen. No, he says, he that cometh to God must believe. That's Hebrews 11. Uh, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, he is a loving God. He is a God who's on our side. And that is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Where you approach him with that in mind. Uh, but to claim that uh, prayer will always be answered in the very way and for the particular thing we desire is presumption. But we present our prayer to God in his will and in his own wisdom. God is too wise. He's not going to give us something that's going to destroy us. And he's too good. He will not withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. There's something that encourages me, beloved. When I'm praying and, and my prayers seem not to be answered, I say, I worship a God who loves me. He's wise. He knows why this is important to me, whether it is. And he is such a good God. He will not. He has even said, I'm better than your parents, who when you ask for bread, he will not give you stone. That's the God we worship. He will, he will. And one day we'll look back and we'll see why at the time when we were so stranded, it looked as if God was silent. Uh, condition number four, we should have a spirit of love and forgiveness in our hearts. Matthew 6, 12, when we pray, we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How can then we pray that prayer and yet indulge in an unforgiving spirit? How do you approach God and say, forgive me, but I will not forgive? You know, there's so many parables around the fact that when God has released you from your debt, God has forgiven you, that empowers you. So if you refuse, and there are people who are Christians and they say, I will never forgive that person. The moment you say that you get stuck in your growth, in your development, because now you are closing the very blessings that God wants to pour in your life. And so the prayer is, Lord, help me. Help me to appreciate your forgiveness so that I can also forgive others. Condition number five, we need to persevere in prayer. Uh, we need to persevere. We must pray always if we would grow in faith and experience. Pray, wake up at five. I've seen people there even before five already. They are already ready to, to, to approach God. Wake up, others wake up at three, others pray. Wednesdays, there's fasting, others fast um, several days in a week. Let's pray uh, always if we would grow in faith and experience. Condition number six, diligence in prayer. Diligence in prayer. Now there's perseverance praying always, but there's diligence in prayer. Seek every opportunity to go where prayer aid. And so uh, we see here um, um, people coming so early in the morning to pray. And some say, but why would you pray? Wake up at five and pray. But what else that is better that I can do at five? Um, you know, but you should be sleeping. But if you sleep early, five o'clock is not a sacrifice. You sleep early, you have your eight hours, then you're ready at five. What better thing would I be doing at five than to pray? Seek the opportunity to go where prayer is made. Those who are seeking communion with God will be seen in the prayer meeting. We used to have prayer meetings on Wednesday, and you see three or five people who come for prayer meetings. They just want to come on Sabbath and sing. But when you say it's prayer meeting, guys, let's come. We are here to pray. No, people want to hear, listen to sermon. Yeah. Improve every opportunity of placing yourself where you can receive the rays of light from heaven. We need to be where prayer is made. Uh, condition number seven, pray in the name, oh, beloved, pray in that wonderful name of Jesus. And when we pray in the name of Jesus, it is not just to pray in the name of Jesus in the beginning and the end. To pray in the name of Jesus is to pray in the mind and the spirit of Jesus. 
When you pray in the name of Jesus, you connect yourself with Christ's promises. You connect yourself with the work that God is doing. You connect yourself with the mind and the spirit of Jesus. When you pray in the name of Jesus, you rely upon his grace. You want to work his works. When you say in the name of Jesus, all that Jesus stands for, you connect yourself with it. When you say in the name of Jesus, you, you mean his character, that I want to pray a prayer that is aligned to, the, to his character. When you pray, you pray in the name of Jesus. It is not just mentioning the name of Jesus. And there's an expression here Ellen Dwight makes that, uh, let me just explain, I uh, still have a few minutes, you, between the mountain and the multitude. So here's the statement. Those who do nothing but pray will soon cease to pray or their prayers will become a formal routine. If all you do is pray and you don't work, you will soon cease to pray. What would also inform our prayer, the content of our prayer must be the needs, our needs, the needs of the people, the situation around us. That drives us to prayer. And then there's this expression that I like, that I like between the mountain and the multitude. If you are in the mountain like the disciples and the Mount of Transfiguration, sitting with Christ there, Peter says, let's build three tents so that we stay on the mountain and enjoy the fellowship with God. No, that's not our, our prayer. You do that on the mountain, but you have to go down to the multitude where demons are wreaking havoc. So it's between mountain and the multitude. You stay with God and you enjoy the communion, but, but you have to move out and get to the, to the foot of the mountain where there's work to be done. And from there, you also sense your need of prayer and strength and courage. And you go in your closet and you pray. And from the closet, you go down to it. It is mountain and multitude. If you pray and there's no burden, your prayer will become personal and selfish. You always pray, pray for my child, pray for, but what about other people's children? Pray for me, pray for me to find work. What about others? I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for yourself, but when prayers are just about yourself and your selfishness, you just want to pray so that you can be seen. Pray for me that I get a car. Pray for me that I get a job. Pray for me that I, I, so that you can, I, I, can, I can buy clothes, I can buy cars, I can buy this. So it's just pray about you. What about praying? Praying for the work of God to continue. What about praying for those who have cancer? What about praying for those who are bereaved? That is why our prayer at five, it's so balanced. It's not just focusing on our personal needs. And condition number eight, we need to praise God more. That's a condition of answered prayer. We need to praise God more. So when we praise God, then it means we understand who God is for his goodness, for his wonderful works. For the children of men, Psalms 107, verse 8. If you read the book of Psalms, it's praising God. It's about praising God, one of the biggest, one of the largest, one of the voluminous uh, uh, book in the Bible, the book of Psalms, where God is praised. Let us always be thinking. Let us not always be thinking of our wants and never of the benefits we receive. We don't pray any too much, but we are too sparing of giving thanks. Let's find time to give thanks to God. That is why we. it was said to us last week, Saturday mornings, beloved, Sabbath mornings is time to praise God. No more about complaints, no more about this and that. We just want to praise God. But of course, people still want to bring their list. You've got six days where we do that. On the Sabbath morning, it's time to praise God. It is time to just Forget about all the other things. Just focus. You know, sometimes you don't see the positive until you focus and tell your mind, now away with the negative things. I want to look at what God has done for me. And you will be surprised how God has answered your prayer. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above. And as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly host. Whosoever offered praise glorifies God. Let us with reverent joy come before our creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. When we do that, we are rehearsing heaven. Heaven, we are not praying for car or health. Heaven, we are praising God. Let's start doing that now. Our kind and loving father, thank you, Lord. Yet again for this reminder. We thank you, Lord, for prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible that teaches us about your character. May we spend time reading, spend time praying, and spend time in communion with you. Bless us, dear Father, even as we continue to pray now. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.